Elle from Stanton House. Welcome to Cyber Go to Market Girl Talk, the go to podcast for women in cyber. During this series, we will be exploring the background of female go to market leaders in cybersecurity vendors. And I'm delighted and honored to be joined on this series by seven successful females to hear about how they got to where they are today and the challenges they overcame in doing so. I hope you enjoy the series. And if you would like the opportunity to feature on future seasons, please do get in touch. Thanks for listening. I look forward to sharing each episode with you bi-weekly. Delighted to be joined today by my fourth guest, Brittany Greenfield, the CEO and founder of Wobby, um, a 2021 RSA Innovation Sandbox finalist that delivers scalable application security for enterprise development teams. Brittany, welcome. Thank you very much, Elle. Thrilled, as you can imagine, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. So thrilled to be here chatting with you about it. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. And uh, I have to say it was great to be able to have the opportunity to meet up uh, at RSA, which we were just talking about before we before we kicked off with recording. Bit of a whirlwind, but um, did you have a good time? I did. I did. You know, I think people were certainly back and looking for that in-person interaction. You know, you just can't mimic some things on you know, video conferencing, like I ran into the CEO of another cybersecurity startup. We've known each other forever and we had just an informal catch up and we're like, oh, you know what? We should actually do that partnership we've always talked about. It's (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We would have spent three months trying to schedule time to catch up and, you know, uh, but that's sort of the informal stuff and, you know, always hearing, I think, especially as a founder and, you know, in go to market strategy, sometimes we get so into the weeds about our own companies. Um, that it's nice to have that moment to, to step out of the weeds and look more at a macro level. You know, we're certainly heading into an interesting period of spending. So hearing some of the trends around that is good and validation. And you know, I think there's also a little bit of a, a you know, this certainly in cyber, there was a long time growth at all costs versus actually delivering hard ROI. And you know, yeah. we can talk about it a bit more, but I think it's something also female founders do a little bit different too. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I definitely want to get into that. But um, firstly, I want to obviously do a, a proper introduction to, to you. So you've got a unique background because not only do you fall into a category where, you know, there's only circa 24% of females, but you fall into another category where, if I've done my research correctly, probably only circa 11% um, of uh, the C-suite level executives in cyber are actually female. So we... Our numbers are going down and dwindling That's even funny. more. <laughs> Correct, and I'll, I'll give you an even scarier stat. Okay. In the um, second half of last year, and this trend persists throughout, uh, um, throughout the various mm-hmm. halves of VC funding, um, the total number of dollars and transactions that were given to female founders in cybersecurity that had no male counterpart or in the founding team is less than the total number of cybersecurity transactions in the second half of last year. Same was true for the first half of last year, for the second half of the previous year. I haven't gone back further, but total all time. Total all time versus just half of a year. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of opportunity, and I just know so many amazing female founders out there that have great experience. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a dwindling number, and I think that the awareness you're bringing to people women being able to be in cybersecurity is so critical. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's such a shame to hear that the numbers on all of these statistics just get lower and lower. <laughs> it's a about it. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, we'll definitely get into a little bit around your experience and dealing with various investors and, mm-hmm. and, and so forth. But um, in the first instance, I'd love for you just to Tell me a little bit about yourself, your journey. So how did you get to where you are today? Yep. So there are two key facts I love everybody to know about me, um, which I think is really unique in my journey into cybersecurity. One, I was a comp sci dropout. <laughs> Two, I was a cybersecurity outsider for about half of my career. And I, th- and I want to highlight those because I think so often people think that in, in both the larger technology profession as well as specifically cybersecurity, if I'm not behind a computer writing code in a hoodie, then I don't fit. And you can be, one, you can be a technical person without writing code. I learned early on that I just lack the art to be a developer, right? That's better left to other people, but it doesn't mean I'm not technical. 
Two, I got into cybersecurity later in my career because I, I fell in love with it. And you know, I realized I'd always been exposed to it and that I did not have to be a cybersecurity analyst to be part of the solving the problem of cybersecurity. So much of, of, of your value in an organization comes from your experience and you can't train for that. Um, yeah. While it's great to see all sorts of certificate degrees and whatnot, at the end of the day, it's about being in, in, in the thick of it and seeing what happens when a company does get breached or when you have to respond on behalf of your customer. And that's why, you know, I, I unfortunately think so many women aren't in cybersecurity that they, they think, oh, well, I don't write code, right? Because there's some other systemic issue out there. No, I am here. I don't write code and I spent half of my career outside of it. And here I am a cybersecurity professional. <laughs> Amazing. Well, kudos to you. I think that it's incredible that you've been able to get to where you are today, despite, I'm sure, you know, adversity and uh, a lot of challenge. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think that there's still definitely this concept that you you need to be able to write code or hack or whatever it may be to be able to be in cyber. Um, but also that it is just so traditionally male dominated. I mean, well, I, I remember being at RSA and one, one of the evenings I was sat in the W uh, and it was my first time <laughs> first time in there um, and I didn't quite realise what to get myself into but it's literally just full of sales guys from vendors and when I say sales guys I mean literally men, just literally men and I had a moment where I was waiting to interact with a, with a, um, a customer and um, I sat at the bar just waiting by myself and I was like Okay, this, this feels it's, a little lonely on the on the on the female side of things. <laughs> and, um, and so on Monday at RSA, I went to a side conference that was more about market trends and whatnot. And you know, we're in a conference room at the Four Seasons, and I'm sort of counting. I'm like, I wonder how many people are in here. There are about you know 45 tables with 10 people at each table, and I'm looking. I'm like, there's not even one woman per table. Um, which also makes it really hard when you're trying to sneak in and out. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. It's, um, I don't know, do you still, do you, well, I don't know if you ever did, but do you find that experience daunting? Because I'll be honest, I find it a little bit daunting. I think there's nothing, it, yes and no. Um, I actually found it more of a shell shock when I got into cyber. I went, right. I'm, coming from, I'm coming from big enterprise tech, not like there are a ton of women in that either. Or, yeah. And then I got into cyber and, and I did not realize, I struggle to believe that 25% number very often, the part of yeah. 24, because it's, you know, because when you walk into a room like that, you're like, oh, okay, where's the other 20%? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you just can't, you can't say, okay, I'm here and we're not even looking at one in 10 people. Um, so, so like, where are they if they are in cyber? And, um, you know, so daunting, I think it's just shocking to my system. But over yeah. time, um, you know, I hate to say it, you, you get used to it. You, you get yeah. used to it. I think, funny enough, coming back to RSA with this being sort of the first full-fledged RSA was the first time I'd felt that in a while because I'd been out of, out of the physical manifestation of those statistics. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it, it, same experience. Obviously, I you know talk about it a huge amount uh, all day, every day, and what I do, and also as a recruiter as well, it's definitely at the forefront of my mind. But actually, being in that scenario and in a situation where you are just you know one female and there's there's very other little females around you, yeah, I, you definitely feel it all the more when you're in the room. So yeah, that was interesting for sure. <laughs> but um. But anyway, let's let's delve into some of uh, some of the questions then that I wanted to kind of cover off with you. So, kind of starting your own company can be risky business for anyone, but there's obviously there is the added challenge that being a female founder in a male-dominated industry is something that this is is an archa archaic notion, um, but it's still around. So, what's the experience been like for you? Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's been a stereotypical experience. So you can go look at the data, especially over the last couple of years. And despite, um, you know, in in the wake of sort of the Me Too movement and, and saying, hey, we need to have more focus on not just women, other under, underrepresented founders, 2020 was a great year where everybody went into 2020, yay, we're making progress on that less than 3%, right? Mm -hmm. hey, and we're almost at 3%, which is horrifying to be celebrating that, but fine, progress. And then in 2020, you saw it be a record low year for women. 
um, yeah. as well, even though it was a record year for VC funding. So it was a double whammy. And you saw those trends persist. And, you know, there's been a lot of research. And I think this is the frustrating thing for me to say I've had a stereotypical experience in that there's been a ton of research about why women get uh, fewer dollars. And yet we still haven't changed the systemic bias. And until we can, it's not, uh, um, you know, hey, we just need to invest in more women. And the other side of it is, and here in Massachusetts, there's some legislation saying we need to require more data reporting. California has done something similar. That's not going to help either. Systemic bias, and there's a great TEDx talk about how women get asked questions differently they, um, in, by both male and female VCs. And it's not, wow, that's great. You really think you're going to go get 100 million people on your, your platform in the next month? Uh, it's why do you think you can do that? Um, and extrapolate that, yeah, and so, so one, that, that puts you on the offensive, and then that puts you in a position where you're not in a position of power to answer and say, well, here's my reason. Um, and then the second, is, is, it wears at you, right? It's not obvious bias. And you're just like, you get frustrated. Um, there's a lot of, as you said, right, you know, founding a company is not an easy task to begin with. And I joke, you know, it's the only place that overachievers go to fail 99% of the time. And then you add that additional layer where you're positive, constantly getting negative feedback into your cycle and you're like, I don't understand why. <laughs> right? Because, you know, it's, it's I don't understand why. And there's unfortunately a reason, but it's not the obvious stuff because I've certainly had the mansplaining happen to me. <laughs> right? And by the way, ma mansplaining can happen to both men and women. And like, yeah. that, that's the easy one to look. I remember early on. I was like, mm -hmm. this is why I keep scotch in my office. And I finished out the conversation more and more. That's the easy stuff to shrug out. But it's that constant sort of very below the surface that just picks away at you. And then suddenly you're like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. I, I never would have thought that that would have been the case, that you would have experienced, I guess, having even just things like questions phrased differently um, and therefore that impacting the way in which you answer and, and so forth. It's, it's and, and I came into this going as a female founder, knowing all of these statistics. And funny enough, I went, yeah, but it's cybersecurity. You either know your stuff or you don't. Here yeah. I am, a founder that actually has a lot of experience in running businesses and pieces of business. I have <laughs> logic behind my model. I actually at once presented my model for growth and why we needed a certain amount of money. And I got to the end. I had all my assumptions, everything. And I said, so any questions like about my assumptions, what we're going to do with it? And the VC, the partner, the founding partner goes, no, we just typically have people ask us for money. They don't explain why <laughs> there's a number. And I was blown away. <laughs> like, wow. well, but that, you know, that's it. And I went, well, in cyber, you either know your stuff or don't. So I think it came as a double shock to me when I started seeing a lot of that same, those same biases, those same behaviors exist even in our industry. It's interesting. Yeah. Do you... Um... So when you're approaching these situations then, do you have certain, I guess, maybe toolkits of behaviours or, or language that you lean on to be able to kind of get across what you need to say and, and try and battle off some of those biases a little bit? Yeah, you know, I think um, I'm going to give you the short answer is... I believe in being yourself and if they can't, yeah. if they won't invest in you or they won't support you, whether you're a manager, right, or if you, at any level and stage of your career, if somebody's mm -hmm. gonna ask you to change and that they're not the right person for you. Um, you know, there is, as I said, there is research about how to, you know, flip the questions just so you don't get caught off guard. And so oh, some of that's just good management. But, yeah. you know, I think if you're a really good manager, it is our job as good managers or executives or good leaders, mm -hmm. if you don't have to have the formal title, to be re adaptive to others. But beyond mm -hmm. that, um, I won't change who I am. And if yeah. I'm not well, good enough for you, you're not good enough for me. I love that. And I think that that's something that's really important is having the confidence and the belief in, in yourself. And I think that's probably sometimes part of the the issue is that maybe women don't feel uh, as though they that they have that confidence and it, it can come across in a certain type of way I mean I've, I've had some candid feedback that I have quite a apologetic tone and that's something that I'm working on a lot I will say one of the things I am working on is that 
not responding to emails with sorry about that or whatnot. That's my number one thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have to work on. Like, by the way, I can have all the confidence sitting here. It doesn't mean I don't go into a corner and beat myself <laughs> up and, you know, and uh, question if I am the right person. Fine. Maybe I should just start wearing a hoodie and a T-shirt and, you know, go in and say, I won't let you do diligence. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, happens well for everybody. <laughs> I wonder how many men though do that. I, I, I don't know why. Maybe this I, maybe this is probably my own bias now, but I just cannot imagine that a man goes and sits in the corner in the evening and thinks, oh, okay, am I really the right person for this? Like doubting themselves. Um, so, so there's data on this, whether or not it's true. Okay. Um, uh, but there's, so um, do you know the stat that for the percent of a job description that a woman feels she must meet, before applying for it versus a man. Okay, so I, I'm gonna hazard a guess. I think I know ballpark. Mm-hmm. But I feel like a woman is probably close to maybe I want to say like ninety eight percent, and and a, a man is probably about sixty five, maybe seventy. Wow, really good. So woman, hundred percent. Man okay. is sixty percent, and I run this test all the time, and I've never come across. I think I've only had one guy that said sixty percent. Typically, they say twenty to forty percent, depending on how they're feeling that day. Wow. Okay. Uh, the official study results say sixty percent. Okay. And, um, you know, and it's something that we actually think about a lot in our hiring is how we write job descriptions. Yeah. Right. So I think you especially. So startups and then cybersecurity startups. Do you want to be a ninja? Do you want to be a whatever? Those aren't words that that not just women underrepresented communities tend to identify with. I don't think I'm a ninja. I think I'm a very successful, well, you know, oh, good experience kind of person that goes in and does this. It's almost like that. Did you see the workday? Um, the workday uh, uh, Super Bowl commercial. Stop calling your employees rock stars. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't catch that one. <laughs> I'll share it with you. But um, their whole point was, you know, was rock stars are rock stars and they've worked a lot really hard, but they can go be rock stars in their own way. But what's a rock star to your company, right? Workday being yeah. a professional. Don't just call them rock stars blindly. But also, like, who do you want on your team? The person that says, I'm a rock star, so I go stand on a stage and perform or by myself and I get the headline. Or I'm the mom that has three kids and I have to be able to keep a level head, right? Like, so we change a lot of our language. We look more for outcome-based hiring, right? Yeah. Can you remain calm in situations versus do you have three years of customer success experience? What, what's that going to tell me, right? And mm-hmm. so it opens up our pool for, for sure a lot more as well. Um, but I think, you know, that's that. there's a reason, unfortunately, some of these stats exist. And you have to be careful about all these little places that they do show up. Yeah, I think that that um, is very interesting, actually. And, and it's very refreshing to hear that you're, you know, even when you as a hiring manager um, are looking to recruit, that you're very mindful of the language that is being used even from, you know, the get go with the job description. I, I definitely see many of job descriptions, obviously, in my role. And quite often it's riddled with, you know, looking for highly ambitious and energetic and that comes with certain connotations and it's like how do you quantify what success actually looks like from that because it could mean different things so yeah no it's 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 interesting but sounds sounds like as though you've got a very different approach outcome based approach which is important which and i think it helps our overall hiring not just diversity in hiring because that's actually still a challenge for us being a female founder does it not exempt you from that um but the the quality of candidates we're interviewing for one role now and all four people I'm like we have a very unique culture right it's one it sets the tone for the culture right yeah. hey we're a bunch of people that like to build Legos and talk about food together right yeah. you know and that's it but it sets the tone because they get to know the company um, they yeah. get to understand what the leadership is like from the top down by how we we present ourselves that way and I think it's the nice lens that as a female founder, I bring to it that I pay, I've paid attention to those things throughout my career and gone, why didn't I apply for those jobs? Um, you know, oh, because you said I had to have 10 years of experience versus the five I had, but that was worth more than 10, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I don't think that every hiring individual, if I'm being totally honest, um, necessarily always looks at it from that perspective. Quite often, it's kind of a quick 
20 second skim of a resume or a LinkedIn profile and all you see is what's in front of you in, in black and white with zero context. Um, and that's why I tend to kind of stress where the the value add piece comes in when you, you are working, let's say, with an external recruitment partner or even if you've got someone internally, HR, talent acquisition, um, to be able to have those initial conversations with each candidate because then they're able to kind of provide that wider context, the kind of here are the pros, here are the things that you might want to consider, but, you know, just kind of breathe a bit of life into into the piece of paper. And, yeah, it sounds as though you kind of really take the time to look at more than just what, what someone says on their resume. Oh, yeah. it's, it's for sure, you know, one, one candidate, he had a bunch of plants behind him. Okay. And I was like, so tell me about your plants. He's like, oh, I take care of them. I was like, you'll fit in just fine. <laughs> and that was, you know, you want to look at the whole, that's the thing that you can't, I get that question all the time about how do you build culture? Sometimes you got to follow the culture, right? Like I was not a Lego builder before I had my team. Turns out we have some passionate Lego builders and turns out I like doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so, some, so it's a little give and take and being responsive, but you've hired a group of people that work together very well. So how do you lean into the best part of that, right? So we actually, as team events, do cooking competitions and stuff like that and cocktail competitions. Because <laughs> yeah. like that. Somebody guy, one guy showed up with a full blowtorch one day in the office. Yep. Oh, for the food? Great. For the food? <laughs> Was torching the bacon for his bacon smoked old fashioned. That was our oh, uh, holiday competition. <laughs> wow, I think I think that's great because um, I mean, yeah, in, in the recruitment world, a lot of it is very centered heavily, I'd say, around going out and and yeah. drinking. If I'm being honest, so some of those ideas that you've mentioned there, I think, are, are great. You just want to be inclusive of everyone. So exactly, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Yeah, we um, play Jenga. We did a picnic in the park and played Jenga. And and yeah, it's your, you know, there are drinks around, but it's not about, oh, we opened up a bar tab someplace. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. No, I, I love that. Um, pivoting slightly then. So I'm, I'm curious, do you have any other founders um, that you follow and admire? Uh, and if so, who and why? Yeah, I, I'm going to say every anybody that is a founder, I admire. And I don't mean that to be, I don't mean that to be, you know, uh, vague, is that anybody that's willing to take on this, this adventure, this journey, this, you know, is somebody I just admire and it's something, and I put this out to your viewers as well. I, I may not have a hundred percent strike rate, but anytime somebody reaches out to me, hey, I, I'm always willing to give, as long as you tell me why you're reaching out to me as another founder, I'm always willing to give 30 minutes of my time to help however I can it takes a village um you know and we're the only ones out there that can understand so i would say the founders that i admire the most most are the ones that that are shoulder to lean on um they're in my community they may not be in my industry but they're the ones that i can call up and say let me walk you through this problem how have you handled it or if you haven't handled it and, th and those are the ones that really rather than saying hey it's about me and my success and i'm a rock star and it's my marquee um, you know, that they're the ones that are going to make, it takes a village, right? And, and some of the stuff we only founders can understand. Yeah. yeah, no, totally. And I should imagine that being a founder, just generally speaking, there's probably a lot that might keep you up at night. So yeah. <laughs> what things, if you don't mind sharing, are kind of on your mind at night then when you are trying to get to sleep? Yeah, you know, I think um, one, um, you know, culture and people, right? Yeah. Hey, uh, what keeps me, what gets me up every day are, are not just our product, but it's the people that are building our product and whether it's on the engineering side or the marketing and everything. And so if something goes wrong on that side, there's, there's nothing that guts me more than that, um, mm -hmm. you know, or that I worry about, you know, oh my God, what's going to happen? Um, you know, I think especially in this, you know, still very highly competitive labor market, you know, even though we are seeing that. What, what am I doing to make sure that they're getting everything that they want at Wabi? And it's actually a question that I ask um, every employee in their interview, what makes this the best decision you've ever made in three to five years? And not because we've IPO'd or gotten acquired or whatnot, but what for you says this was the best professional decision? And then that's on me and we try to have check-ins. We call them, you know, forget the performance reviews, professional development sync ups, because one, we want to yeah. desigmatize them and say, hey, one, your career journey is fluid, but let's make sure 
or that we're both getting what we need out of out of this relationship. And so if you think that you want to become a team lead, great, here are the things that you need to do. Why don't you go do some research on maybe a conference or education or something, and then we're going to find mentors for you, or we're going to find help find a course, right? And so it's really about that partnership. The second, um, you know, that keeps me up is, you know, it's my job as the founder and the CEO to keep the lights on. Right? How do I do that? You know, revenue, investor dollars, um, you know, and that's, that's a full-time job in itself. Um, you know, they know my team, I make it very clear to my team that when I'm in investment mode, that 80% of my time is going to be on that. And I'm also probably going to be very drained the other time. And mm. so just be prepared for that, right? Because it's, it's, it's a dog and pony show for better or worse. It's a lot of questions. It's, getting at this thing that you've created, right? Um, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of energy. Um, so I, my team knows, it's, I think it gets to, you know, people talk about transparency a lot. It, to me, I say it's, it's honest transparency. I can't always tell you everything, right? We have one public company that's a, uh, that is a, uh, you know, an investor. So we can't talk about everything all the time, but I'm always happy to share stories and all that sort of stuff and say, guys, we're in fundraising mode. You will see me in that corner hearing, saying the same thing 15 times, and then I will be dead in my eyes. <laughs> so if I'm not reactive, it's, everything's okay. So I think that's the second one. Now, then the third one is I always worry about, you know, the competitive edge, right? Yeah. We were founded ahead of the curve, and we said we're going to do the hard stuff first, so that way when the market come, comes right, which it is right now, and there's a lot of pent-up demand, um, we'll be there, but you know, literally just sat down and had a conversation with our CTO going, man, what's our chat GPT strategy? And it's not about the chat GPT because right now it's in a shiny object, but it aligns very much with what we've always talked about. How can we meet people where they are from a, from a security expertise, an application security expertise, is, and generative AI is perfect, but it's cybersecurity, so there's a lot of uh, complications. You know, we'll basically have to train each thought for each question, right? Yeah. You can't all share that knowledge. Um, so, you know, I think those are the things that say, how do I figure out what I'm doing in six to nine months today when the whole world can change a lot in six to nine months as the last three years have been proven more? <laughs> yeah, all right. well, that's a lot there to take on one's shoulders, I think. Um, you know, and there's a couple of things that stuck out to me there. Firstly, is when you mentioned... Um, you know, about the partnership piece, actually, mm -hmm. and the relationship, I think that that's so important is that, uh, especially as a founder, with the individuals that are working for you, your company, your vision, you know, everything, it's it's still deemed that it's a relationship between two parties and, yeah. and that each individual needs to, I guess, essentially get something from it. That's, you know, that's, and I don't just mean kind of a, a paycheck at the end of it, but that... You know, that thing kind of that takes you through your career and helps to stretch your imagination and challenge you and help grow and, and all of that just as they help the business kind of grow. So right. it's, you know, it's the number one piece of advice I give an interview separate from lobby. I say, remember, an interview is a two way street. You have to decide if you want to be there. Is this going to be the thing that that says help, helps me fulfill my story? Get over, yeah. and some of this is learn from the things that I did <laughs> and I did wrong. Get over, I'm going to have this title by this period in time. Because if you, if you focus only on that, you're going to miss all these other random opportunities. For me, it was the opportunity after my company, the company I worked for being acquired, or to move down to Australia and stand up our business unit for a year. Right, where, where was I going to know that that could happen for me? But instead, yeah. when you focus on the story, you go, oh, well, this is about me not just getting international work exposure, but also about me learning how to be a business leader thrown into a brand new situation, right? And so the more you focus on your story and where you want to be, the easier it's going to be to say, I want to take this job, or I don't want to take that job, or communicate to your manager. Maybe when you're having a frustrating period of time, hey, I'm not getting what I need out of this because I don't see, I can't see how to become that team lead or that business line manager or the, you know, head of marketing and whatever. Yeah. And that communication piece is incredibly important, I think, yeah. because if people sit on things and don't say what they're truly feeling or thinking or wanting, then how's anyone going to know? But 
yeah, I, I think that it's uh, it, it's important really to be open and you know, like you said, you, you can't always necessarily share everything, but as much communication as possible is 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 always going to benefit both exactly. both parties for sure. Right. It's the it's like you said, it's a relationship, it's a partnership, and partnerships are two way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, um, I guess again, pivoting slightly. <laughs> we have a lot of topics to talk about in this. I know, I know. I'm thinking of everything that I wanted to ask because I think because uh, speak being tr- truly honest, you're the um, you're the first individual who is on this podcast and probably the only one scheduled thus far who is a CEO founder female. Um, and I think that's probably a whole other thing in itself. I mean, a lot of the individuals I've spoken to very much um, are in the marketing space. Yeah. But if I think about sales engineering or those that are founders or those that are CROs, um, yeah, it's, it's again, statistics, yeah. not not good, but... <laughs> it's, it's true. Statistics exist for a reason, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But what type of individuals do you think that um, are, are important to surround yourself with to support your success, but also the business success as yeah. well? I, so I think there, you have to bucket them into two, two groups, two advisory groups, so to speak. Yeah. One mm-hmm. is about the business, and okay. one is about you your personal board of advisors, so to speak, and then you sort of have your corporate board of advisors. Right. And the corporate board of advisors are gonna be everything, and you need to look at what your business is, but you need somebody that's gonna, one, help you navigate the market, mm-hmm. two, be somebody that you can call, because even, even in, you know, whether it's a second time founder or a great investor that's just been very operationally focused, let's look at the SBB crisis. Right? Mm-hmm. We had a great investor and they said, here are the five things we fortunately weren't impacted by, but if you're on this, here are the five things you need to do. That is something that had happened to nobody before, right? <laughs> right? And, and as a result, you know, as a result, like those are the kinds of partners because every startup is new, right? Just like every person is unique and, but repetition helps. So you need those people that are going to help you navigate, whether it's operationally or market. Um, you know, and I think one of the best pieces of advice I got from an advisor is that the best advisor is the advisor that doesn't call you and say, why aren't you using me? But rather the advisor that always picks up your phone call. Um, right. Other than the call you to say, Hey, how are you? Can I check in on you? Right. That's a great advisor. But you know, there are certainly a lot of advisors out there that go, well, we need to have a meeting because I, I need to tell you how to do this. At the end of the day, remember, you are the expert in your own business. Nobody else is a better expert than you and your team. Um, but you can't do it alone. I've said it before, and I'll say it 5,000 times more. It takes a village. Yeah. The nice. other group is that personal board of advisors. Mm-hmm. And those are the ones that you need to go to. You know, my best friend happens to be in VC, but not in this space. And right. sometimes those are the shoulders to cry on and just be sympathetic ears. Or sometimes it's the the reality, the sanity check, right? Yeah. Hey, can I just run this by you? You know, I we happen to have an employee, and I I, I complained about six weeks earlier or about her because she wasn't delivering reports and whatnot, and I was working. You know, hey, what can I do to help? I know you're really backlogged, whatever. And then, sort of six weeks later, we separated, and. Um, and I realized that she hadn't been doing her job is the short version of it, right? It was an early, right? It was the canary in the coal mine, and which I knew was coming, but it got caught up in some other stuff. And, you know, my, one of my personal board of advisors said to me, don't you remember calling me six weeks ago saying, you think there's something going on? And when you asked about it, you got a snap reaction. I went, I did. Thank you. Right. And because she, they're out of the weeds and whatnot. And you know, and they're they're there. They're your biggest cheerleaders, and you need that, right? You are going to be getting hearing no, not just more than yes, no, almost all of the time. And you need those people in your corner that send you. My friend sent me a. Um, they all have Wobby baseball caps. And my friend sent me her kid wearing a, a her one year old wearing his her Wobby baseball cap. And you're like, I need that. And, yeah. And, and that, those are the people that are there thick and thin and are going to make sure you keep your sanity because if you don't have those folks, whether from a business perspective or a professional perspective, you're, you're really going to feel alone. And even if they don't understand what you do, they'll always be there for you. Yeah, I think that's so incredibly important is having 
having those people there that can be that cheerleader. I mean, I think that each person that you connect with in your life give brings something different, and just as we bring something different to to those people. Um, and I think that having those individuals that can either give you that kind of reality check and snap you back in place, or the ones that can be like, do you know what? I hear you. That's that's. I get that. I get why you're upset. Uh, for what of a more stronger phrase, totally understand. Um, yeah, it's it's important because we're, we're all human at the end of the day. And I think the fact that you also have that um, open approach to seeking advice is probably something that supported your success. Some people might not be so open. Yeah, you know, and I say this. So when I was st first starting the company, um, two people said, you know, I said, what, what advice do you have? Two people that have been CEOs, you know, they'd worked with startups. Neither of them had found it. One happened to be a man. One happened to be a woman. And the first, and the man said to me, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. And I was like, uh, you know, chip on my shoulder, like, come on, what kind of crap is this? If you need to yeah. add that. <laughs> and I was like, what? why are you saying that, right? And, and I don't typically, and I, I love him. And I was like, that's such a weird thing for you to say. And then the woman said it about six months later, as I was burning out, because yeah. I felt that I had to do it all on my own. And I went, oh. I get it, he, right? It wasn't the comment. And so actually uh, one of our investors, I was quoted on it, put it on a billboard off the side of 93 in Boston once. This was years <laughs> ago. And, um, and uh, but yeah, don't be afraid to be vulnerable because how else, and it goes back to your previous question, how else are you gonna get help? Nobody thinks that everybody knows everything. So how are you gonna get help if you don't ask? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's key. And it's uh, interesting that you had that um, experience. And I guess, you know, when you got to a stage where you were feeling burnt out, you were able then t to see the different side of what that, that particular individual mm -hmm. was sharing with you from an advice perspective. Um, what would you say are some of the benefits then that um, businesses would be able to see if they were actively encouraging to seek a diverse workforce in cybersecurity? I mean, at, at the end of the day, diversity, and we talk about it a lot, obviously, um, diversity means diversity in thought. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I've known for quoting Einstein to say, the same thinking that created these problems won't be the same thinking that solves it. I may get it a little off, but, and it's exactly that, right? The more you bring together different perspectives and diversity can exist in a lot of different ways, different yeah. ages different life experiences, um, different training backgrounds. Not all of our engineers are comp sci backgrounds, right? Mm. Some of them are self-taught. Um, we go from, on our engineering team, from 60 to 23, okay, mm -hmm. right? You have different experiences on all of that. And then you add, start to add the demographic differences as well, right? And it's just, it, you have better problem solving, you know, period, the end. And, you know, and then on top of it, we're all better people for it too, right? Who wants to go spend a bunch of time with somebody that looks just like them? You don't. And if you do, you're probably not right for our company. Hey, yeah. We're just going to iterate on all of the same things the same way. Hey, and, you know, you know, diversity just means better problem solving at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I've definitely obviously supported many our hiring managers uh, throughout, throughout my time. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, some people do hire in their in their own image. They don't. Sometimes they don't even realise they're doing it. But when they tell me their requirements, I'm like, "This is yeah. a carbon copy of you." <laughs> it, it is, and it's the you know, I'm sure one. So one of the things that I think about in hiring is that really great hiring managers or managers and leaders don't say, "How can I go carbon copy this?" They hire for holes. And I think this is really important as a founder, as you grow your business, to say, I, as the founder, am I, I'm going to hold on to this because this is the most important thing. And, and that's going to change over time, right? And somebody explained it to me well as, you know, one, when you just found the business, you're one box. And then one day, you're going to get that partner for me as the CTO. And then it's going to be two boxes, back mm -hmm. of house, front of house, right? A, and then, you know, it, they'll start to expand. And so I'm always looking to say, what's that next hole? And that could be something as simple as, you know, I'm not the best HR ops person, right? Can I do it, right? Just because I can doesn't mean I should. And every and going and hiring somebody for that hole is important. You know, and then the second thing to your point about just hiring carbon copies, I'm sure you've professed this before, 
right? There's the A players hire A plus players, mm -hmm. B players hire C players, C players hire D players. And when you get into that carbon copy thing, rather than saying, what is my need? You get yeah. to start, you know, you see the disintegration of the, of the quality hey, of the two. Such a breath of fresh air hearing you say that. When do you need me to help partner with you and recruit? Because <laughs> this is what I need. <laughs> Every hiring manager should totally have this ethos and uh, we'd have a great partnership. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's important. Um, it, uh, it's like, but most people don't, right? And I say that having learned learn from great managers and then having watched the exact opposite happen. And when yeah. the exact opposite happened, a hundred people left in nine months at one of my companies. And, and it was the 100 original. And there were only 300. I'd say it was about 100 out of, a, yeah, 100. Yeah. Out. They do say that people um, don't leave companies, they leave people, Correct. managers, right? Whatever the saying is. But it's probably quite quite apt, I'd yeah, say that, sure. that saying. Yeah, yeah. So I guess to round things up then, if, uh, if I were going to ask you lastly to leave us with one piece of advice um, that you think has kind of contributed to your success um, you know, during a time of adversity, what, what piece of advice is it that you would share? Um, I would say it's that you're the master of your own domain. And, and, I, I, and notice I'm saying domain and not destiny, because destiny, you know, it's both hard work. I was asked on a survey earlier today about being a founder, right? Is it just hard work or is it just good luck or is it a combination of the two? And some of it's a combination, I believe it's a combination of the two, but the master of your own domain, you own your own story, you own your own destiny to some degree, you are an expert in whatever you're an expert in, and, and, and so if somebody wants to talk to you, you are the expert in you. So don't ever give them reason to think, don't ever let them, sorry, embrace that, don't ever give them reason to make you doubt that. Because yes. who else is going to be a better expert in what you do? And um, and I think the more that you can remember that, and it's hard, especially when you're founding a company, especially when you're the only woman in a room sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. or only person that looks like, like you in a room. Um, I th it can be really, really hard because it's easier to accept the doubt than yes. to stand up for you. And it's why I said I will not change myself for other people. Um, you know, they're just remember hold on to that you may have to go take a moment and bring mm -hmm. yourself back to that but hold on to that um you know i think that's that's what gets you through the tough times yeah yeah no i agree i think uh, you do sometimes have to take a moment and check yourself and say it and sometimes it might be i mean we, we shouldn't always i guess have to seek validation in others but sometimes having someone else say Hey, you know what you're talking about. And that's yeah. exactly, and, so, and I mean, I'll, I'll admit this here, right? I don't necessarily, sometimes I need somebody to say that, right? Yeah. Uh, right, this is my following through on my own being vulnerable words. <laughs> sometimes I literally sit down and think to myself and I'll walk out of a crappy meeting or I'll be feeling down and I'll go, wait, there are so many people that believe in you and are supporting you and are offering you help. They're not doing that because they think you're bad. <laughs> right yeah. they wouldn't be there I can tell you I have two text messages right now that came in while we were chatting and it's somebody that has stood by me and is making a new intro why would I ever doubt that that I can go do this when he is spending extra time connecting me to other people in his network so try to remember those little things celebrate think of them almost as little victories too because it'll help you you get, you know, keep that, some people call it the trophy room, right? The trophy room does not have to be the shiny object, even though I have one behind us, right? And, <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't have to be that shiny object, it has to be that win. That person was kind to me. That was a win because they saw something in me. That's really interesting. I, it sim sounds, um, that kind of theory sounds similar to something that I, I know I've heard definitely rumbles in, in, in our own office, but about having something like a, a brag book, but I think yeah. yours takes it slightly differently in that it's, it's also, if, if, you know, let's say there's someone else that wants to connect you with someone, that in itself is a win because no one's going to do that if they think that you're going to fail. So uh, keeping a log of it. Um, 
uh, if you look at top military teams, the guys, mm -hmm. some of the guys that have the toughest jobs have brag, brag books to remember we did some hard things and it was probably hard outcomes and may have lost a bunch of people along the way, but here's the big thing that you did. There's, um, if you want to cry over a movie, uh, Dog, I think. I think it's Shannon Tatum. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, that. <laughs> it, it, they get into some of that. I'll, I'll follow up with what the name is, but I think it's just called Dog. Right. Um, and he, he goes and rescues a, a not rescues, has, it becomes responsible for a dog that's done military service. And they talk a little bit about the brag book. So I'll fo follow up on it. But it's exactly that concept, right? You're, yeah. you don't, this is, this is just neurological, right? If you allow that negative cycle to continue, you're going to wire your brain to constantly think negatively. And you've mm -hmm. got to be an over optimist. You've got to be a pragmatic pragmatist as well, but you've got to be an over overly optimistic person in this journey because you're going to just get that no so many times that you've got to remember all of those little wins and celebrate each and every one of them. Yeah, very, very important. And I think applicable to so many different people in so many different ways. I mean, I can even feel how that resonates as a, you know, as someone who's quite guilty of, I like to call it I'm being realistic, but I know, I know on times I'm probably doing myself a disservice. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. Right. It's you can be realistic with positive accolades for yourself. And that's yeah. not just being a founder or an executive. We all need to do it at, at points in time. I think it's, it's important to remember. It keeps, it keeps you going, right? Yeah, so if anyone's gonna take something away from this particular episode, it's to go away and write themselves a brag book, yes. keep a log of all of the, the good things, the positive things, and look at that in, when times are difficult. Correct, we have a um, list of all of our marketing assets, right, for the company, sometimes that's the most tangible. And so you yeah. can go through and we can see and we're like, oh my God, here are all the times we were mentioned. Here's the quote, right? It's it's obviously a tactical thing, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I look through that and I go, yeah, hold on one second. The other cool thing um, that I do is we keep historical, uh, we've got one of our wireframes here, but we keep historical, um, we have a company history like photo album. And so some of it's events, um, yeah. but some of it's like, wow, look at that old wireframe versus where the product is now. Or I remember when I created that and, and it wasn't even a product, but I said it was a product video. And it's fun and I'll share it with the team sometimes to go, hey, look how far we've come. I found this old baby. <laughs> Yeah, no, that no, that's amazing. I, I love that. I sometimes do I sometimes do that with LinkedIn. I go and just look yeah. at my profile and I'm like, wow, I've progressed a fair few times. Yeah. I've been promoted a fair few times. This is cool. So it's uh, it definitely works. It, yeah, it's something it does, there. It <laughs> you need to you need to get out of that because you know, if you just stay in the weeds, you know, overachievers are always gonna look at what more can be done. And, yeah. um, and, you know, versus what you accomplished. And, you know, sometimes you need to level yourself up a bit and remind yourself that you're your own best champion. Yeah, no, I love that. I'm, uh, I'm going to go and look at my, I'm going to go and start my own brag book now. And uh, <laughs> I think it's a great list, actually. <laughs> like, if basically now wants to go create, like, a physical Wobby brag book and, like, go into, like, old scrapbooking. Yeah. Just an RSA when we won, won another award and I brought it into the office and it sits on the shelf and it's not because it's an award but it's because it's a moment in time, right? We can look at that and say, wow, in 22 versus 20, pardon me, in 23 versus 22 when we won that, look how far we've come, right? Yeah. Uh, you can see it in terms of your customers, you can see it in terms of your employees, right? A, you know, you can't keep every employee forever, but we, every, I talked about Lego building, we have, um, everybody gets their own Lego. And yeah. so we have old employees in there too, right? And, and I see when they get their own Lego, like they get to customize their own Lego. Oh, uh, first, nice. okay, it's in Wabiopolis. Anybody's invited to come visit our Wabiopolis. And um, <laughs> yeah, they each have their own. And you're like, oh yeah, that's you know, so-and-so. He always loved lunch. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> There are ways oh. to do it, to memorialize it and, you know, come back to your culture and celebrate it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. Well, thank you, Brittany. You've shared some incredibly helpful insight there. And I um, I know that even I myself am going to take what you've mentioned about the little brag book and, and, and so forth. It's uh, 
it's, it's a really good reminder. So thank you for joining us. It's been incredible to, to speak with you. And um, yeah, thank you. The feeling's mutual. And thanks so much uh, for the light you're shining on all the amazing women in cyber. I think the more we get the voices out there, the more we can bring amazing women from other industries in. Um, so exactly. thank, you, thank you for your support. No, no problem at all. Well, look, have a lovely rest of your day and um, thank you again. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode. I hope that you found it inspiring and insightful. I will be releasing each episode of this series on a bi-weekly basis. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard, please keep your eyes peeled for the next release. I've loved having you here today and look forward to having you on the next one.